Hello everyone and happy Wednesday. Welcome to the Brain Stream. Evan and Tatiana here with another Mind Mind Main Show talk show for you today. Uh, thank you everyone who's in chat already, who's joining us, and thank you to you who may be lurking and working or who are not here yet but planning on being here soon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Like so that. how's everyone doing today? Happy Wednesday again. It's hump day. It's the middle of the week. So for those of you on the daily grind, it's almost done. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's getting closer and it's the good kind of light at the at end of the tunnel. You're not under the hill. You're not over the hill. You know, you're, you're cruising. It's, it's a good day. <laughs> that is uh, that is the definition of uh, of hump day, I guess. <laughs> you're, you're over it and you're about to go on down. Unless you work in retail and then you just work every day. So I'm so sorry. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, got the hoodie, got the sweatpants, and I got the socks, too. It's a whole collector's edition. You should check it out. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, hello, everyone, especially Danunji, Kiki Slider. Uh, let's see here. For Gala's Vet, uh, we have Bat Sky Starman. How's it going? Uh, yeah, the intro that we have, if you uh, are seeing us on Twitch, a visual massage, of course, for the brain, <laughs> right? A, a massage for the brain. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in on iTunes or on Podbean uh, on every Wednesday, thank you very much. And hey, if you want to join the show and get involved in chat, uh, feel free to join us every Wednesday at twitch.tv slash mindmindtv, where you can actually be part of the show live and uh, talk with us, conversate with us over some awesome, awesome topics. And I like that. I don't think ever, uh, anyone's actually uh, noted that as a visual massage, but I really like that. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the best uh, kind of compliment uh, that I think I've got. We've gotten on that intro, so thank you so much. <laughs> um, oh, snow, snow. Is the East Coast... Uh, Still getting buried, buried in snow. That's rough. We actually were just talking to somebody here in LA about snow the other day. How they'd like they'd like to experience it for one day, but just one day only. <laughs> just to see it, just to be in it, and then it's gone. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I think that's most people. Yeah, you know, take a few selfies out day. in the snow and be like, hey, mom, look, and then get the hell out. <laughs> get the hell out. Well, and a north nor'easter hit actually the East Coast recently as of uh, Friday, if you didn't know, if you're not on the East Coast. And so it hit uh, especially the northeast pretty hard, uh, New England area. So they've got a, a fair amount of snow that they're dealing with and a lot of cold that they're dealing with, uh, which has been interesting for them, right? Because they were actually having warmer weather uh, not too long ago than SoCal was. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that was... It was like... The weather just sort of flip-flopped for that week. <laughs> yeah, we just did like a little weather exchange. It's like a student exchange program, but it was a weather exchange. And then they're like, you know, we don't like it like this. So then they switched right back. It's still pretty, it's still kind of cool in SoCal, you know, slightly chilly, but it's, it's all right. It's starting to get back to normal and evidently it's starting to get back to normal on the East Coast as well. Yeah. Uh, but we have an awesome show for you guys today, so I hope you're ready to dive into these game-themed topics that we have picked for you today. Uh, first up, we're going to talk about the outcry over Far Cry 5. Bum -bum. Then we're going to touch on Ubisoft and what it's doing to fight trolls. They're just going to mod everyone in the company. They're going <laughs> to give every, every person in the company a little green sword. <laughs> And they're going to go around hacking trolls. That's the goal. <laughs> We're also going to be talking about how the White House wants to take on the video game industry. Like, fisticuffs. Like, I think I'm using that word, right? Fisticuffs fighting? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. And uh, last but not least, we are going to be chit-chatting about TwitchCon. In particular, TwitchCon 2018. But we're also going to touch on TwitchCon 2017. Because we're on Twitch. So we're going to talk Podbean, about it. And YouTube, and other places. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to talk about it. So yeah, that's what we've got going on for uh, for you today. Yeah, you know, the, the goal of our show, again, is to get a conversation going. And it's never... The main goal isn't always to say, well, okay, this is the destination of the conversation. This is where everything needs to go. But it's to open up multiple pathways. Because a lot of times, it's hard to say where something will be taken, right? It, it takes time and development and growth 
for any single subject, uh, whether it's, you know, in the arts or sciences or humanities, whatever it is, you know, sometimes it's just not as easy as a black and white situation. There are a lot of gray areas. And, you know, it's interesting because right now there seems to be so much uh, cultural upheaval and, and so many issues uh, amongst people within the U.S. specifically um, that we figured that, you know, talking about this Far Cry 5 situation was was right on point and, and really hits on a major nerve, which is what a lot of articles are starting to come out with. So for those of you who are not familiar with the actual story of Far Cry 5, the core story is um, that the story of Far Cry 5 takes place in Montana, more specifically Hope County, Montana. Uh, you play as a sheriff's deputy who has arrived in Hope County, only to discover that the entire region has been taken over by a doomsday cult, uh, the Project at Eden's Gate. Your job is to help rally the locals into the resistance and take out the cult. Meanwhile, some locals will take the side of the militia cultists. So the reason why this hits a nerve is because specifically in 2016, 2017, uh, we've seen a sudden, I wouldn't say growth, but a rise or at least a louder voice from uh, those within the center of the US, specifically like say areas like Montana, where we have this kind of outcry from conservatism or uh, from those who are conservative and you know they feel like their voice is not being heard and so of course there was a lot of push specifically in this um, voting cycle uh, between Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump and also you know we had the Green Party uh, with Jill Stein and the Libertarians with Gary Johnson and I mean there was many people involved here uh, you know, but the main drama was, of course, with really Democrats versus Republicans or Republicans versus Democrats. Some of it was just really a lot of hype being created by news organizations because they treat everything like a boxing match nowadays rather than an actual political discussion about where we should take our, our country. Uh, but there was some earnest outcry, though, uh, from those who are conservatives saying, hey, you know, we're not getting our voices heard. We're overlooked or overshadowed by those on the coast. And so, you know, these are people who primarily are white and who maybe be uh, could be or are very religious and also, again, hold on to that sense of like gun rights and everything and, and having, you know, as many guns as you want. And, you know, of course, those and many more facets are what's being hit in Far Cry 5. And the other thing that really intensifies the whole situation is the fact that the deputy sheriff that you play is also of color, as many of these articles say that the deputy sheriff is of color. And so now you're dealing with that tension, too, because a lot of the people in Hopes County will respond to you in a very specific way due to that. Now, that is the, the moments of tension are purposefully in there by Far Cry 5. But what they've said is the developers have said is that it's not their intent um, to actually put that in there. Like the, the intent is for the, the color, you know, for, for that issue between the different kind of races and everything. They like that, that they wanted a bit of tension and they wanted to help kind of intensify the story. Uh, but really, they said that because the cycle of game development takes four to five years, their goal really wasn't to really hit on everything that happened during the 2016 election and on up until now. It just so happened that everything just kind of fell together. All the pieces sort of just collided and, and it worked out in that sense. Um, but that that wasn't their original intent. Uh, they said the actual story was originally about how we have lost the art of being human together. <laughs> but because of its placement in the U.S., people will place a lot of narratives on the story. Because that's the other kicker, too, is that the Far Cry series has always been about an exotic location where Westerners come and mingle with local locals of foreign lands. Um, but it's never happened in the U.S., right? So all the kind of political commentary and everything like that has been you know, kind of almost in a way like projected onto another locale. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they now put it into the U.S., everyone freaks out. And so, you know, some people have said, well, it's kind of interesting because you're now entering this world 
having to fight basically your own people, your own kind of tribe, if you will. And that's unsettling for many people as well. And um, so in Far Cry 5, uh, you know, it, we're, we're getting a lot of buttons being pushed. Mm. And so I guess the whole question of this is, is are the people getting worked up about this? Do they have a right to actually get worked up about it? You know, in you know, is this is there some sort of re relevancy um, to this game um, that that would make sense for them to get so worked up? And also to you know, should games be pointing out cultural issues, uh, especially within their own country? Do you think they have the right to do so? And you know, again, have we seen this form of 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 expression in other arts and media formats? So, I mean, what are your thoughts on this, Tatiana? Well, I think, you know, when you're saying that they're pushing buttons, for example, right, and people getting worked up, it's American people, right? It, that's who the buttons are getting pushed for, and that's the people getting worked up, right? Like, like people who are playing this in China probably don't give a rat's ass, right? Like, yeah. they're not looking at it and like, oh, no, this is an attack on me, uh, because they're not... Uh, you know they're they're not here and they're not being portrayed in the video game so you know the far cry franchise uh, as you mentioned had a lot of different other settings before right so this just happens to hit a little close to home in a lot of ways <laughs> um but that uh you know I feel like artists, especially like writers, whether they're doing a, um, a film or TV show, whether they're writing a book or they're doing video games, I think that for the most part, we're, they're obviously very in tune with what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's hard not to, it, if you're making a game that's supposed to be somewhat realistic, aka set in our timeline, et cetera, et cetera, it's hard not to draw upon what you see is happening in the world when you write it. Right. And so I think, you know, no, they may have not sat there and been like, hmm, I think in the next few years, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to let me write about it. But they were probably picking up the vibes th that uh, are around, you know? Right, exactly. And when you sit down and you write something and it's a compelling storyline, you kind of have to go with it, you know, especially if you are a writer and you're trying to uh, speak truth, you know, the, the truth of the human condition. So I think that. Right. It doesn't sound like they necessarily did this on purpose, but at the same time, if you are trying to set something realistic down on a piece of paper or in a game, it's hard not to be influenced by what's happening in the outside world. And, you know, if this hits a little too close to home, that's because that is what's happening right now, right? It's like this this we, this tension between different sides. It's this, um, uh, it's, it's, in some ways, the truth, and when people are faced with their own truths, right, they they tend to be like, nope, that's not me, especially if it's a truth that they think isn't very popular. Yeah. Right, because if you were, um, what's the word? If you're comfortable in your own skin, you're comfortable with your own belief system, and you're comfortable with how you live your life, this game shouldn't bother you, right? If anything, let's say you are like the antagonists in this game, then you should be like, oh yeah, finally somebody made a, uh, you know, a game about me. <laughs> uh, you might be like, why am I the villain? But <laughs> at the same time, uh, so anyways, I find that interesting uh, that well, people are that people's buttons are even getting pushed because, first of all, it's not like the game isn't going around being like, oh, this is you right here, right? So they're obviously seeing something of themselves in the game that they don't like, right? Which means that they're really, you know. Uh, fighting with something inside themselves as well well yeah and it seems like to me there are a couple different reasons to get worked up by an issue but i feel like in this situation specifically a lot of it is that people are seeing this and seeing a part of themselves or seeing a part of society and it's something where they've just tried to ignore it right it, they're the type of people that they don't really want to fix an issue they may voice their opinion but they're not willing to really take themselves out of their comfort zone and actually change something and so now this game this storyline is is getting them out of their comfort zone and they don't like it so then they try to speak out and say, oh, well, this isn't right. And, oh, well, we're going to boycott you because you make me feel, you know, insecure. You're making me feel 
um, you know, anxious about having to face this reality. But for one thing, racism isn't anything new and it's still <laughs> happening. It was happening many years ago. It's happening today. And, you know, we're looking at the fact that violence still happening today. Um, these sort of cults or people being drawn to a cult of personality. Uh, that is still happening today, no matter the country, but especially in the U.S. because people are looking for a voice because they don't feel like they have one. And again, they don't feel comfortable stepping outside of their comfort zones in, in really taking on an issue, but they will go out of their way to support someone who is doing it for them. So it's like they don't want to be out on the front lines, but they'll send someone else to do it because at least, you know, their goals are aligned. I want to note, too, that uh, the company behind Far Cry is actually Ubisoft, who is a French company. And um, the first Far Cry game itself was actually developed uh, by the German studio Crytek. So it's not like an American company is making a game to talk about American values <laughs> and to point fingers. This is an international company that looked, you know looks at what's going on in the world or has gone on in the on in the world for some of their older far cries mm -hmm. <laughs> or, uh, their different settings and they and they created a story right uh, but obviously again as i was mentioning you're going to create a story that is influenced heavily by what's happening in the world whether you really realize it or not well and uh, you know what though to to kind of play devil's advocate people are going to look at that though and go well ubisoft they're not even in the us so how dare they write a storyline <sighs> that happens in the US when they don't know anything about America, they're not part of, a, you know, they're gonna see that backlash too because people who are within this sort of situation, they're gonna find any straw to pull to be like, see, I'm right, you're wrong. It, it It's not even a conversation at that point. They don't wanna have a conversation. You know, they're just saying, no, this is what's stuck in my head. This I, I, I take offense to and that's it. And again, this isn't just for, we're not saying just for conservatives or just for people uh, in the Midwest or, you know, the, the heartland of, of America. We're not talking about just them, but just people overall tend to have these habits no matter the situation. You can be on the far left of the spectrum, the far right of the spectrum, and you will find similarities in the personalities. Maybe not in the core beliefs, but in the personalities of how they go into an argument or a debate and how they fight against that. And so, you know, we're seeing that here with this backlash as well. But again, like I was saying, cults are not a new thing. Racism, not a new thing. Uh, violence, not a new thing. Uh, people basically in the in the Midwest, you know, some of these people, I mean, again, some of them are stereotypical and are supposed to be exaggerated, but there are influences from people out there in society. You know, you unfortunately, with every stereotype, there is some sort of reality some sort whether no matter whether it's a very small thread or a thick rope that connects it all there's something there right every stereotype starts from somewhere it's not like someone just sat down like hmm, i'm gonna create a stereotype they're like okay i noticed enough people where i'm like hmm yeah <laughs> let it's me like, say it, it's a trend <laughs> i mean even if it's folk psychology and it's a warp perspective right there's something there and so, you know, we're seeing that with this game. Now, personally, I think they have a right to, you know, share this game. People in their chat are saying, well, yeah, it's a game. It's freedom of speech, right? And that's absolutely correct. And actually, uh, games being represented of, uh, of a, as freedom of speech has even strengthened since the late 90s, early 2000s. So they definitely have that case for this game. And also, again, you can't look at it and go, oh, well, how dare this game? We should be looking at going, holy shit, they pulled information uh, from what's happening now. Because like I said, racism is not a new thing. So wait a minute. It's 2018 and we still have these this racist, you know, bullshit happening. We have a lot of stupid shit in 2018 that should not, not, should not still be happening. Exactly. Like we have, you know, sexism still. We have all this different stuff that's going around going, I'm better than someone else. My penis is larger than this person's. It becomes like a huge pissing contest constantly. Yeah. And it's like, we haven't really moved past this yet. I mean, seriously, it's 2018. And so instead of looking at someone pointing out a story that happens to have these elements, why not just actually go after the freaking issues in the first place and take on, I don't know, racism, take on, I don't know, sexism. If you feel like your voice isn't being heard or, you know, there's people stomping at your, um, stomping down on, on your opinion, 
then let's come together then. Instead of saying, well, screw you, no, screw you, it's the Hatfields versus McCoys, why don't we actually discuss it and talk about it? And instead of saying, nope, you're wrong because you're on the left or you're wrong because you're on the right, why don't we take all that BS out and actually look at the real thing? What is happening now to people overall in the US? What needs to happen? Can we work together on this? And that's, that's what we need. Again, both sides, no matter of the political spectrum, are looking for the same thing. It's just how they go about it. You know, how they feel uh, certain end goals will, will solve their plight or their, their uh, issues or their obstacles in life. So, yeah, there's going to be some, you know, differentiating points. That's fair to say. But then let's see, again, how we can work together. Put the political stuff aside. Put all the platitudes to the side saying, well, you're a libtard and, you know, you're a Republican jackass or you're whatever this and that. <laughs> like, libtard? Put all the, oh, that's a new one. Yeah, put, put all the names aside and let's actually figure out people because we're talking about people's families mm -hmm. and we're talking about friends and we're talking about the future. You know what I mean? Like, again, eventually we're going to grow old, meaning this generation even of millennials. We're going to grow old and we'll need someone who, who can actually kind of grab the steering wheel and let us be in the passenger seat. <laughs> Um, so, you know, with that, we need to make sure that we're creating a stable foundation and, you know, these little things are, I think what's needed. And again, this isn't a new thing. Art has always done this. Video games have always done this. Mm -hmm. Even back to Shakespeare, when he wrote plays, he always did this. But instead of saying it was in Europe, because, you know, honestly, he would then get defunded because he was funded by uh, the royalty of the time, by Queen Elizabeth and what have you, that he then put all the plights of England but then set the setting in Italy or set the setting in France or somewhere else. And so you he could say, well, I have that disassociation, but people knew, right? But this game, they're not saying, hey, you know, this is happening in Canada, I don't know, randomly, or this is happening somewhere else. This is, no, this is happening here in the US. And you know what? Honestly, I feel like if it stings a little bit, maybe you should start reevaluating how things are being done here then. And I'm not saying not for games, but I'm saying in, in general, for politics, for government, and so forth. I mean, that's really what you need to be looking at. Yeah, this reminds me of a, of a saying I've uh, been seeing recently. I don't know who actually said it, or maybe it's the collective we, the royal we that said it, but, you know, everyone appreciates your honesty until you're honest with them then you're an asshole. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's kind of what this reminds me of. Again, it's, uh, you know, everyone's saying like, oh, I love to play these types of games and I love to, you know, watch these kinds of movies. Oh, until they show me a truth about myself that maybe for whatever reason I'm not too happy with. Then it's like, fuck this company and fuck this game and fuck this. And it's like, uh... <laughs> well, and it's interesting that you brought up the point of artists who set the setting of whatever they're writing about in a different place. Uh, by certainly by that um, by that logic, it, this may not be necessarily uh, a commentary on the U.S. Maybe it's you know the French trying to commentate on what's happening in Europe as well, right? Because I mean, there's cults there too, and there's cult of personalities where someone where a group of people gravitate to one specific leader. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's not new. Again, it, it happens in, in a lot of the, especially first world countries, but even in the smaller countries where you have dictators, people help those people rise to power for a reason. And again, a lot of games where you're the single protagonist trying to save the world, you're always fighting against these horrible villains. Mm -hmm. So like this is not a new type of game either. No, not at all. You and know, especially like against cults <laughs> or... You know anything like that i think or like the oppre you know trying to save the oppressed and trying to yeah. liberate something like you're always trying to be like a good guy in video games right with the exception of some games where you actually play the villain like in dungeons too um you know you're usually somebody trying to save somebody from terribleness and trying to you know exterminate the terribleness in the world well, and as of recently too, well, not really recently, but I would say within the past decade, it's always been the U.S. when it comes through from the, the news, the main media outlets, and also sometimes the White House, it's always been us versus them. Meaning it's always been us, the U.S. versus another country across the seas, across the oceans. And, you know, all of a sudden now we're being thrown into this storyline where, no, it's us versus us. And they're like, well, how dare you? <laughs> like, wait a minute though this this goes against everything that we're being told right now so then maybe 
you should also question the media. Maybe you should also question the news that's being reported to you. You can even you know question this news. I that's again free speech. You're able to do so. You know you have the freedom to do that. Um, but again, maybe you should be questioning more than just accepting what's being given to you via online sources again just as like this or uh you know media sources on television abc cnn fox news doesn't matter which side doesn't matter which tilt they have question it there's always spin there's always messaging and you know it, it just is what it is um but actually to jump into chat here vargala's vet says games are free speech if you don't like it vote with your wallet that's true don't buy it don't vote uh, with your wallet yeah. Kiki Slider says, everyone has a right to say anything about anything. It's price of freedom. Art shouldn't have boundaries in, in what sort of narrative it can portray. Um, Denung, uh, Denungi says, I see video games as an art form. They have a variety of games that have offended people. For example, GTA, when I was younger, was controversial. It's probably still controversial, <laughs> but it's still a form of free speech. I do not know a lot about Far Cry, but that's how I feel. Um, Kiki Slider said, again, great, great um, talks or chats in the chat. Uh, well, dystopian narratives always find a point of intersection society. Most thoughts about potential societal turn uh, require real observation and an understanding of history. A cult of personality building a society has happened before, both in the past and in contemporary society. 1984 is a perfect example of that, in my opinion. Absolutely right. <laughs> Vargalas Vet says, my plan is to live forever. So far, I'm doing a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think we're we're kind of screwing it up for our uh, future generations for sure. We're we're leaving a little bit of a mess for them to clean up, like even more so than other generations have left in the past. Oh, absolutely. There, there's more things to create a mess with. I feel like nowadays. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, an Acer in chat says too, the media needs to be questioned hard. Yeah, absolutely. What is the narrative of being purported to us? Again, we've been taught from a very young age, okay, certain people in certain kind of statuses or that hold specific positions have, you know, authority. They, they've been recognized as being, you know, potentially respectful and truthful and trusting and, and everything else. So that's been built into our psyche. So we instantly go, okay, well, they're to be trusted and we don't question their resources or their, you know, their sources of information. But again, it needs to happen. That absolutely needs to happen. And yes, I understand, you know, we're busier than ever, even with technology involved. It's actually made us more busy overall because we can do more stuff. But again, we need to take the time to question certain things and to really think on certain things. The less we think, the easier it is for us just to go on with our lives with our head, you know, basically our heads in the sand. We're not seeing clearly. And I think with this, some people are not seeing too clearly and just see, well, you know, you're shaking things up or you're pulling my head out of the sand just even a little bit, even if it was unintentional. And I don't like that. That makes me feel insecure, even though they won't say that. But they're, it's going to be like, you know, oh, I feel insecure. And so with that, they're going to then attack the people who are creating a story rather than the real issues. And, that, and that's always been a problem. But it's it's still specifically a big problem even now. Well, and yeah. <laughs> yeah and I, I don't even know what would be the best bet for that. You know, like, like how do we fix that besides just a bunch of people starting to wake the hell up and see this and go, no, this isn't the problem. They're just talking about a problem, even if it's loosely connected. But we should look at a bigger picture if we're getting this worked up over it. Well, and there's a lot, of, a lot of other countries that get, you know, worked up over some of the movies that the U.S. puts out that represents those cultures or those countries in a not favorable light. And again, I just want to stress, this is not a U.S. <laughs> company that's put out this game, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if anything, right, we should look at, oh, is this how maybe we come across to other countries? Then maybe we should rethink about how we do things. Exactly right. And, you know, to say then, well, because I know some people will also say, well, I don't care what they think of me. Well, yeah, I'm going to get upset do. about it anyways. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like it doesn't make sense. You either are getting upset about it because it does affect you or you don't care. Which one is it? And a lot of times when people say, oh, I don't care what people think. They do. 
Yeah. Well, there's a lot of hypocrites in the world, and I hate hypocrites. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, and what I find interesting, too, is that some of these people, I won't say all of them, but some of the people who are doing this outcry are also the ones who who basically tell other people, oh, you're too sensitive about subjects. Oh, why are you mm. being so sensitive about this? Why are you bringing this up? That's not what they meant. But yet, of course, now this comes out and they're all up in an uproar. And it's like, folks, we have got to stop being hypocritical. We got to start questioning ourselves too and our motives and go, wait a minute. Am I really arguing with this person because I want to be right? Or is it that I have facts to back up what I'm emotionally feeling? Because just because you emotionally feel something doesn't mean it's correct. Just like, you know, even though you could have some of the facts, it doesn't mean you can't have an anomaly that occurs that goes against those facts. So you really need to look at both the emotional as well as the logical sides of things. And it can be very tough for a lot of people. And I understand it, right? And no one's perfect. And when you get dragged into this, you know, wave of emotion, it can be very tough to take yourself out of it. But I think that's when it's the most important, you know, time to actually sit down and think about it then not just get swept away with with it with everyone else but to really sit down on it and go okay this is something big then if this is so important to me let me actually think about this let me actually look into this to make sure i'm right cuz there have been times especially with me where you know within this past i say 2 to 3 years to, just with everything that's been going on in politics where i've wanted to jump up at something but you know you got to train yourself so i've been i've been personally trying to work at that and i'm not perfect at it i'm still working at it but there's times where you just want to jump at something and you go, nope, wait a minute. Like, <laughs> let's actually think about this first. You know, does this side have a point? And, you know, I feel very fortunate, at least on my end, because I, I originally come from the Midwest. So those people that are, you know, raising issues and, and having this plight against the situations that are happening right now in politics, I feel for them. I, I get what's happening there. You know, a lot of these people have lost their jobs. Companies have moved out from the Midwest and have gone to other countries like Mexico or India. So they've seen a lot of phase outs. Um, the government hasn't stepped in to help these people either. Uh, ironically, though, they, they clamor to their representatives who haven't helped them at all. You know, but it, it, it happens, all right? You're looking for anything because, you know, you're trying to feed a family of five and you're working 16 hours a day, both family members at that point, husband and wife, or you could be, you know, a single parent and everything, again, working that many hours while trying to raise a child. You have a lot going on in your life and it can be difficult and you can feel like I'm not being heard. So, you know, I, I totally, totally get that because out of any you know section of the u.s has been probably hit the hardest i would say the midwest has and with that has come a lot of fears has come a lot of propaganda that's been built up and a lot of things that have been pushed to them by politicians from all sides i'm not even just going to say specifically republicans or anything like that but from all sides to say either you're bad or you should be paranoid because someone's going to take something from you and so that's all they have to work with right and it, it's a tough situation. Again, I know a lot of these people who who are in in that group, and so you know I, I get where they're coming from. Whether it's the right way of going about things is another thing. But I can I I appreciate the fact of what they're going through. So you know I I get it. But yeah, it's like it's important then more than ever for both sides to really think on it and really go, you know, what are the real issues here, and not to blame a game developer. You know, th this is just a story. And again, they, they said, too, it's an exaggerated version. You know, if anything, it's not putting a direct mirror to society, but it's putting like one of those fun, you know, uh, funhouse mirrors to oh, society. God. So it's like, you know, you get bits and pieces of it, but there are some distortions to help with the story, to help with the tension, to help with the overall plot line. Because in the end, they just want to make it an engaging story. But they have put in some real elements to humanize it so people can connect to it as well. That's true, and then some some good comments in chat again. Uh, Kiki Slider, our, our generation is content with yelling at each other without finding solutions or trying to find a solution within their own bubble uh, bipartisanship, as it were. We But we need to talk to each other with an open mind, and that's exactly true. I think a lot of people, um, certainly, uh, you know, in the U.S., have a very much 
uh, as Evan mentioned, us versus them mentality, right? Like we're so eager to label ourselves, I'm this or I'm that, and then just cling to that identity as if it's like something that we were born with, right? And it's like, they're choices that you make uh, to some degree, to depending on kind of label you're putting on yourself. And, um, and it's interesting because most of the time there's, we are way more similar with each other than we are different. You know, uh, even looking at, you know, the whole men versus women, like age old thing, right? And it's like, if you look at actual differences and similarities between those two groups, there is way more overlap between them than there are differences. And, but we're all so quick to say, oh, you're different from me in this way. Boom, you're over there. I'm on this line. Let me grab all my people with me. And I don't want to hear what you have to say which boggles my mind because we are social creatures, right? We thrive on social interaction. So why are we so quick to dismiss everything that is the other and 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 sort of like wrap ourselves in like blindfolds and just we're over here, I'm over here with my team and you're over there with your team. Like, what is that? I don't know. I don't know where that comes from. Uh, maybe I have to read more about psychology, but I find it fascinating. Uh, and, and I know, you know, there's also a sense of belonging that uh, that we all crave as well, but th I feel like that belonging uh, need t gets taken to extremes. You know, again, why can't you belong to this group, this group, and that group? Why do you like have to just belong to one thing and then everything else is bad? <laughs> yeah, I remember in high school. I mean, it's just the high school mentality, right? Either you get separated by how much money you have, by what race you are, which happens or um also by what music you listen to i mean i remember people are like okay that's the heavy metal kids those are the right. punk kids you know these are the hip-hop heads over here the, you know all this different stuff and i'm like really now we're trying to dissect people by what music they listen to like i listen to everything so i never fit fit into a group you know whether for good or for bad i was like yeah i like that and i like that and i like that who the fuck cares like I can have, you know, different feelings toward different things and I can, you know, or the same feeling to different things. Like, why does it have to be only this one thing that I'm supposed to be focused in on? And that dictates who I am. I was sitting with the drama kids. That's why I was. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. Oh, those are the drama <laughs> kids. Oh, those are the jocks. I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah, it's it's in, it's insane, really. Um, and Acer, of course, people care about what other people think. Right. Yeah. Even when they say, oh, I don't give a shit. That's when they give a shit. <laughs> I, I swear, the more people talk about something, the more they care about it, right? Because then they wouldn't be talking about it because they wouldn't care about it. You know, it's it's sort of like a lady isn't going to call herself a lady because she knows she is one, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Kiki brings up another good point. The internet and the mentality of an omnipresent soapbox has given people the ability to have instant catharsis and vindication of their opinion. The world itself isn't as simple as normal human interactions anymore. Our technology is changing faster than we can biologically adapt to it. Exactly. And we speak about this in many of our of our past episodes as well, where uh, technology is, is sort of making us... Uh, <laughs> well, I wish we would evolve faster, but it's, it's, it's like forcing us to evolve in ways that we are like can't yet. Uh, we're not prepared to and we're dealing horribly with. Uh, but exactly, right? Like... Just because you can say something online in a forum, on your website, on your blog, uh, you know, it doesn't make it true. It just means that you now have a public space where you've put it up. And um, but then if somebody comes across it and they have a similar opinion, they're like, oh, yeah, see, like I am vindicated in my opinion because somebody else wrote it on their freaking blog. And it's like, mm, it's not. No. <laughs> Yeah, and Acer has a great point too. Uh, he mentions that the thing is that we humans as a species are social animals. We are not the strongest, not the smartest of the fat or of the fastest animals, uh, but we are social animals. That is an important thing to our survival. We want a tribe to fit in, and that is being utilized to create a we versus them scenario. Exactly right. Instead of us going, okay, we as the human race, especially now that we're going into a more of a of a global economy and everything else and, and, and having to really worry about global politics and how it impacts everyone, uh, you know, we do get more put into these little groups and then even larger groups, but it's still an us versus them. Uh, this is this is absolutely nothing new. And I I wish people would see that again. We are based on our on we are 
what do I want to say? Our survival is based on us working together. I mean, if you want to look at the simplest form of things, you have a phone. You have service on that phone. Guess what? If it wasn't for other people, you wouldn't have that. So if you're so attached to your smartphone, think about if other people weren't there to make that for you. Again, you know, you some people I feel like survive off their smartphones. So I feel like this is the, the best example I can put out there right now is the fact that if someone, people work together to provide you that service for that phone. People work together to build that um, device. People work together to design that device. Or if you want to even simplify it more, if you grab a coffee at Starbucks every day, guess what? That cup, that coffee wasn't just manifested out of thin air. <gasps> really? I, I know, it's shocking. But the baristas are so good. At making it manifest out of thin air. Yeah, exactly. they're magic. And they don't actually ever do anything, right? It's just there. It's just because yeah. we exist that that coffee cup <laughs> is there filled with coffee. And that we have the word for it, which is coffee and cup. <laughs> coffee cup. Yeah, no, it's like baristas make that coffee for you. But guess what? There are other people in there who also got those resources, who pulled those resources together so that coffee could be made. And guess what? A lot of those coffee beans are from other countries too. So it's like, folks, we rely so much on other cultures, you know, not just our own, but also other people in general. So the things you wear, you may have bought them with your money. Yes, but guess what? That money was printed by a certain group of people. Um, that money was made by a certain group of people. Again, we are all sort of cogs in the machine. And I hate using that reference because most people like, I hate feeling like a cog in the machine. But we really are because we are social creatures, because we thrive in, and live based on the, so the society or tribe that we're a part of. But at the same time, we've all got to be working together in one cohesive tribe, one cohesive group, rather than in us versus them scenario. And if we had a better understanding and grasp of that, I don't feel like this would be an issue. People would just go, yeah, that is an issue that is impacting society. Or they point out good points. How do we change it? I will say, though, that um, Conan Exiles is, uh, is teaching me that uh, all I need to make clothes are to gather some, like, reeds or whatever. So I can I can pretty much, like, survive by myself on that. Exactly, right. You Thanks. can just right-click on the reeds. Yeah. And when you right-click... No problem. <laughs> You know, yeah. there's like a little time where it like kind of threads itself together, but then you have shoes. Right. And then I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll learn how to farm later. So like yeah, I'm exactly. like I'm like halfway to being self-sufficient and off the grid. Gotta love sarcasm. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, talking about, again, people uprising, uh, there's actually a very interesting story from Ubisoft. If you want to dive into that. Uh, yeah. Or actually, you know what? Let me dive into it. So <laughs> uh, Ubisoft uh, was, uh, as of recently, has announced that they're clamping down on Rainbow Six Siege trolls. So they're trying to take on hate speech. Uh, currently, they're attempting just to eliminate altogether toxic behavior. And this is just one step into hopefully many steps, ideally, to take this on. Ubisoft strikes again. Yeah, right. So Tom, we're already talking about Ubisoft <laughs> with Far Cry 5. Now they're creating more drama. Uh, and I seriously, this is funny because this is creating drama, trying to take out the drama, trying to take out the toxicity and making games fun again, ironically to the first section we just talked about, though. Uh, but people are in an uprise. People are pissed off about it, mostly because they're the toxic trolls and they just want to get away with it. But... Yeah. Um, what they're looking to do is they're going to track how often players are reported using hate speech and issues and will issue bans accordingly. Uh, banning can be anywhere between two days to permanent. Uh, originally before, the bans were anywhere between two to 15 days unless something super extreme happened, such as hacking, where then it would be a permanent ban. Uh, now, this... Uh, this new kind of implementation of system will only impact PC users. Uh, what they said was that PS4 and Xbox will still be subject to Sony and Microsoft's own codes of conduct. So they can't really implement it into that system. They're going to let Microsoft and Sony handle it, but they're going to at least test it and introduce it into the PC version. Uh, they've said that they've always been against language deemed illegal, dangerous, threatening, abusive, obscene, vulgar, defamatory, hateful, racist, sexist, ethically offensive, or constituting harassment. Uh, but then again, you know, before it was just 2 to 15 days for banning. And even then it sounds like, though, again, I'm just going off of inference here, but 
it sounds like they really didn't keep track of specific accounts and all the issues with that. Um, it just looks like it was like, oh, they looked at reporting as a one-time thing rather than really keeping a, a, a true tracking system down on these toxic accounts. Um, so it seems like they're implementing more of that system as well as what's interesting is that if they're not permanently banned, uh, their uh, account will be ban uh, will show that they were banned for toxicity. So now they kind of have this scarlet letter, supposedly, from the way it sounds, or this God. sort of like notation on their account showing, hey, they were banned for toxicity for everyone to see. And they're hoping that that will be hopefully enough of a deterrent for people not to screw around with that. Um, now, it doesn't seem like a huge update, though, in respects that they've they've already had a reporting system. You know, they've already had people uh, reporting these issues in the past. So it's not like gigantic by any means yet. Um, so basically what they've had in the past is that after a match, uh, whenever you're you're into looking at all the stats and everything, who did the most damage, who did the most kills, who did this and that, blah, 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 blah. Um, you can actually do a, a report then and there for specific players if they were toxic or if they just were AFK the whole time um, or if they did, did team killing, all this other stuff that you can report. But it's a very simplistic form. It really just is, okay, report, this is the reason, done. And you can maybe put like a few quick notes, but that's it. Or you could do a more in-depth report where you would contact Ubisoft support which, again, you could already tell that's a hassle. Trying to go through any support system is always a pain in the ass. Let alone, yeah, you you were, you know, maybe attacked verbally in a game or whatnot. And then now you have to try to go get all this documentation together. And a lot of times, you know, they'll be like, oh, well, do you have any screenshots? Do you have any recorded footage? Well, no, because I wasn't expecting someone to be a complete asshole to me. Uh, but I guess maybe you should have that realization in the back of your head when playing these games that you're going to do that. I don't know. Um, but so there's always been that sort of system in place, but I guess it's not been as severe and as specific to just toxicity overall. And so it's going to be interesting to see what happens because this is just the first step they say of many. So the questions that we have for the audience here and for, you know, us as well is, you know, what is toxicity? Where, where do we typically see this toxicity? And, and how it's become a part of gaming, unfortunately, because many articles, and I agree, um, have said that this has just kind of become, unfortunately, a staple within the culture of gaming that you're, you have to expect now this level of toxicity. Some toxicity is going to happen. It's, you know, you're not going to get along with everyone. You're going to have disputes over certain strategies or tactics that you want to implement or character choices. That, that's going to happen. But we're talking about extreme toxicity where people don't feel safe people you know i'm not saying like safe space but like where people have threatened their lives or you know have gone after them because of their gender or or what or what have you um just been you know super volatile and you know and then again what does this type of toxicity say about our society currently which i think we've discussed a lot of this in the previous ubisoft <laughs> talk about far cry 5. um but yeah what are what are your thoughts tatiana uh i mean i get along with everyone um except assholes so I don't know. I, um, well, I think toxicity, uh, at least to me, in gaming specifically, but I, it kind of breaches all, all aspects of my life. Toxicity is when someone is reacting negatively and just lets their words fly with, with no, no thought, no thought. Just they're like in the moment, their emotions are running high. Boom. They just say whatever the fuck is on their mind, which is... You know, we talk about the ability of people to express their emotions. For sure, feel those emotions, say what you say what you mean, and say it out there. But the problem is a lot of these folks don't actually mean what they say necessarily. They just, they feel so bad, I think, about themselves for whatever fuck reason. And the only way they make themselves feel better is by attacking somebody else, right? And that's my opinion <laughs> it's my professional opinion uh as a person and um but it's this this it's this like there's no filter online you know you've got your keyboard in front of you something terrible just happened you may have sucked at the game or they may have sucked at the game and there's just no filter of like if they were in front of you face to face you probably would have not necessarily said that but because they're just a name a username and then your keyboard's right there and your fingers just fly and they just go and then 
What happens then is, especially if you don't get the response that you're looking for, or if the other person says something back to you, the emotions just keep getting higher and higher and stronger and stronger. And your words, it gets nastier and nastier because now it's no longer about what just happened in the game. It's no longer about anything right before that moment. All that that person is focused on is being right. They just want to feel like they're right because now they, they already feel shitty and now they're being told that what they're feeling is invalid in some way or, or fashion. And it, it's unfortunate because it doesn't, this type of toxicity doesn't help anybody, you know, but in gaming, I think there's so many people also who don't necessarily know how to respond co quote unquote correctly to this kind of toxicity. And so they either egg it on uh, or respond with their own toxicity or don't say anything at all, which in some respect can even be be worse because now that person thinks they can get away with it and they'll do mm. it again later, right? Because if nobody says anything back to them, they're just like, yeah, I was right, right? Like that's their their own vindication of their own opinion because no one has said anything to them. Even if the other person quits the game or does something else, right? They're just like, great, I was right. There's nobody else to tell them wrong. Now, if they do get somebody talking back at them and trying to like use facts and everything like that, most of the time, uh, at least from my experience, I've seen the other person kind of just back up, back up. They might not try it again with that player, but they're probably going to try it again later with another player. But at least, at least they got you know, a little slap the first time. Um, and then, and then if somebody just responds with more of like, "No, you suck. No, you suck." Like, well, you know, and then the, the language escalates. Um, it, it, that, that doesn't help anybody at all. That just makes it worse. Uh, the person who first started the toxicity, I'm sure, is probably like, oh, see, I was right. This guy was a dick. They don't look at themselves as being a dick, <laughs> but that person surely was. Um, and I say he because, unfortunately, from I think a lot of our experiences, a, ma a large, vast majority of it, uh, this toxicity that we experience tends to be boys. And I say boys because uh, men just don't just don't do that shit. They like there's no time. There's no time for that. Um, and it could also be because, again, statistically speaking, there's less women who do play these types of games. But I also feel like um, the women who do play tend to be the ones who just don't say anything, mm. and then just they just leave, um, and and then don't you know don't want to interact with that type of thing. Or they have chat off. Or if it's video, uh, uh, voice chat, then they have that off as well. Maybe they never even hear it right? Um, as well. Well, it's a tough situation in general from a psychological perspective because the game is trying to build up these competitive elements. And even though a lot of these games are team-based, you're still pushing this competitive level and you're still even creating competition amongst your group because... You know, they also break down, well, who did the most damage? Who did the most healing? Oh, who did yeah. the most this? Who did the most that? And sometimes it can be helpful just to see kind of how you're doing as well as, you know, did someone really just go AFK the whole game or did they actually do anything? Sometimes I mean, that stuff can help. But I think then let that be sent to the developers and to people who should monitor that shit rather than the people themselves because they're going to come up with any or, you know, any reason um, to say, oh, this person didn't pull their their weight whenever we lost, for example. And so you're, you're putting people in this competitive sense, in these competitive moments, and expecting them, though, not to be competitive even against their own teammates. And then, you know, start to get, you know, the 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 aggression to rise. When a lot of, when most of these games are about aggression. They're about, you know, shooting the other character, kicking the shit out of the other character. It's never about, like, who can give the, you know, the, the strongest hug. Like, that's, that's never the issue, you know? It's about, oh, did I do a headshot on this person? Did I kick this person in the groin? Like, like you know, what, what, did I hit my targets? Did I hit my marks? And then you're expecting them not to go against each other. I mean, it's tough, right? Because again, we get that emotional side that takes over the rest of our logical brain and basically ties it up, locks it into a basement and says, ha ha, now I'm running things. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's where, th you know, shit hits the fan. But again, these games are meant to invoke emotions. They're meant to invoke fear or stress or, you know, certain elements of anxiety. They want you to really experience it and be in the moment. But the problem is we then let this anxiety out and this stress out on our own teammates and you know we don't we don't see this as much with of course when you look at sports right and people will say this too we don't see that much in in football per se or soccer or 
or basketball or baseball like there seems to be this camaraderie right but the problem is is that these are people who see each other on a daily basis face to face whereas you're not dealing with that with these matches a lot of times like well well i'm never going to see this person again so screw them i'm gonna you know type out a dissertation on why you know their <laughs> life sucks <laughs> And they're, and they're going to do that, right? Because they're like, oh, I don't have to deal with this person. Or after I'm done, I can just block him and never have to see him again, never have to deal with it. Whereas with the sports stuff, you know, they have to deal with those people and they have to figure things out and work it out. Otherwise, they don't have a friggin' job. You know, they, they can't play the sport that they want. Um, so it's, it's difficult from a digital sense now of how do we kind of implement that and build that camaraderie from those type of sports into a video game. And I don't know if there really is a perfect way, to be honest with you, unless you start getting people on actual teams like an eSports type of situation. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, 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 it's really tough to say. I don't feel like there's a super clear way of 100% of solving the issue. I do agree, though, with banning people, not for just you know simple words, but if they're harassing people, really going after people or threatening their life or anything like that. Absolutely. I think there should be a stronger reporting system. And I think there should be more efforts from Ubisoft just to be better on it instead of just going, oh, kids will be kids. And yeah, we have this system, but it's only just to make people feel more comfortable, but we're not going to do anything about it. Because, I mean, even from a business perspective, if you want to look from a marketing perspective, I'm going to look at your product based on the people I'm playing with. And if your audience seems to be a bunch of toxic trolls, I'm, I'm done with it. Because this is the thing, too, in my personal belief is that okay i know i'm gonna come across toxic people it's gonna happen i'm not gonna agree with everything everyone does that's fine but if i'm hitting this if i'm getting hit by the same toxicity from new people every single time i play your game it doesn't matter if you have a block function function it doesn't matter if you have a language filter i'm just gonna be tired of playing your damn game because it's not fun anymore i mean who wants to jump onto a game where you get insulted every single day that you, you you play it and you know women can definitely attest to this because a lot of times when you admit you're a woman and that you use a voice com God. and you start talking bam harassment instantly oh yeah you have boobs oh my god okay everybody chill it chill it the fuck down <laughs> yeah, so it's just like you know it's just like again i don't i don't know if there is a perfect way i think there should be some sort of system though because again i don't want to fucking play your game I mean, like I've, for instance, I stopped playing World of Warcraft because I got tired of dealing with assholes on a constant basis. It wasn't the fact that I would deal with one or two who would say, hey, you don't know how to play your character, delete your account, da 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 da, whatever. Noob. Yeah, like, all right, whatever. You know, it, it's childish bullshit. You, you, you block them or whatever and you move on, right? You say that they're spamming you, you move on, whatever. But if you're getting hit with that on a daily, I don't give a shit about your game anymore then it's not fun if i have to constantly go out of my way and be pulled out of the story be pulled out of the world in order to go through all the technicalities of how to ban someone and how do i report it da, 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 or how do i block them like it's not a game anymore it's you know it, it like it takes away the aspect of why people game which is kind of to escape all the bullshit. no all the bullshit just car gets carried on into digital form so, I mean, yeah, I think there should be a system, but also we got to be careful of people abusing that system. We've seen it with Blizzard. Blizzard tried implementing harsher uh, systems for people that are toxic, but also they had to start implementing a system for people who would abuse the reporting system because you had some of these assholes, especially some people who were, uh, you know, actual pro owl players who are going on stream and banning pe and like reporting people just because they didn't do as good of a job as they did. And so then those people got banned. Those streamers got banned. And I'm not going to name anyone specifically. That's not my call. It's not my, my job to, you know, start pointing direct fingers, but just overall, you have people that do also abuse the system too. Yeah. And you know, and it's interesting that we talked about the, you know, just that as a as a woman coming into, you know, sort of the the male dominated gaming uh, voice chat, <laughs> uh, it is tough enough. It's like I, I I was literally afraid to even say hello, but I wanted to talk in voice chat because, especially in co op games, right? Like it's just so much easier to like work together. Um, and I was always so afraid. But um, the other thing I never actually thought about was also, yeah, even as a as a guy, right? Like, you don't want to deal with that shit every single day. Like, nobody does, right? Like, who wants to be yelled at and 
called a bunch of names and and just for no real reason right and um and i know we actually talked about this um I think in, in one of our game streams is, you know, the other weird thing about toxicity is it doesn't it doesn't actually solve anything. Like, let's say somebody gets really upset because player A has been like terrible at what they did. By you yelling at player A and be like, you fucking suck, get off the server. It doesn't, one, help that player get any better, right? It, you Like, offer constructive criticism. Hey, um, you sucked balls, and here's why. A, you did this. B, you did that. Three, like, you know, like, kind of go through through a list or something. Like, these people are just like, you fucking suck, get off the server. But there was a time when <laughs> that player also sucked. Like, maybe when they first started playing and they didn't know how to play, you know? Uh, and it's fascinating because they don't, they don't want to either, like, they also don't want to help these people get better. Right, they're just like get off, like get get out of my way, so I can do better. Not let me help you, um, which well happens if you meet if you get grouped up with that person again. You're gonna have that same terrible experience. So why wouldn't you want to help them get better? That was the other thing that I, that I think toxicity is very interesting because you're not solving anything either by being by being an asshole. Like, <laughs> and there's a, a lot of amazing commentary in chat too that i'd like to to get to as well um our ex manga says you know toxicity to me will always be a part of gaming you're going to get upset uh but i don't agree whatsoever with threatening speech yeah you play a game you lose like yeah you want to be like motherfucking far you know and and most people don't like blaming themselves so they're gonna blame their you know uh, if they're especially if they're on a team uh they're gonna blame somebody else for like dropping the ball <laughs> but then you don't have to actually go and and then say that you know uh in my opinion um and this goes right back to people not opening their mind and needing to be right exactly yes absolutely manga it carries over to many different subjects <laughs> especially the ones that we've talked about today as well and kiki slider brings up a good point of mental health you know you remove the notion of inhabiting a space of judgment you establish a uh, similar this word simulacrum uh, and can really unload uh, but it's a deeper problem than just censorship um, that these I think these game industry has in general um, because it doesn't solve the deeper problem of mental health exactly well you know mental health on top of I would say almost like a lack of being able to communicate effectively yes like as as we were mentioning about the far cry 5 uh game just in this previous topic you know we had mentioned that their goal was to show that we have lost the concept of being human together basically and we see that now very strongly in this situation where we forget that we're speaking to other human beings who have feelings thoughts concepts um like ourselves and so we refuse to put ourselves in their shoes as well or try to figure out the situation. We just get heated. And yeah, as you put it, we just blame everyone but our but even ourselves. And you know, so it's like it's mental health, it's it's a bit of just social interaction and how to improve on that. Right. And and uh, as Acer says too, you know, uh oftentimes it is boys who think that they're the best in the world in these games and then they can't live up to that image and then they can't fully process how to work with that and so it's like everyone's fault but mine <laughs> it's tough it's tough and also i mean it's a you know at the end of the day right at the end of the day it's just a freaking game right like okay so you lost the match it's gonna be okay it's a game you can replay it you can get better when you first started walking you probably fell down a bunch of times because you were a little baby who couldn't walk the problem though <laughs> the problem though, and I, I to to slightly push against that is the fact that these games so prominently focus in on stats these are your stats these are how you're performing you're not doing well you're not doing well but you but you see it's a team-based game so then you're going well it's everyone else i've been teamed with i'm with all these shitty teams and i can't I feel like I can't get out of bronze. I feel like I can't move up into this kind of tiered system that I have. And so, again, it's also the gaming companies making it super competitive and putting all those numbers in our face. And yes, as they can be beneficial for growth, uh, it can also induce a lot more stress, a lot more anxiety, and can, again, create more issues. So I guess, you know, the real question for me would be then, is it worth putting these statistics it right in front of people's faces or should we just go it's just a game fucking get over it 
you know, you didn't win that match. Hopefully you'll win the next one. And that's a good point. And I think, you know, um, as a person who is very competitive right here, pointing to myself, I want to see that stuff. I, I love being first, right? Nobody wants to be fourth. Um, <laughs> and when you're I not don't... first, you're last. <laughs> and, um, and I get that. And I think, you know, as a game developer, I would imagine that in an ideal world, <laughs> people have enough Mm, like self-esteem and confidence in themselves that they'd be like okay i'm not for you know i'm not first right now but um that's okay props to my team a uh, teammate who did really good and i will be first next time right uh or i'm okay being a support healer because i love healing people and that doesn't mean mean that means i don't do any damage but that's okay right and i think the game developers are are in the ideal world right we want to assume that everyone is gets it right and i and i get how they don't get it and and then right when you're faced with those uh things depending on your mental health condition depending on how your day is going depending on what you want from the game depending on just a lot of different factors right like you want to win and the focus is on winning um but that's because that's the type of games that those are right mm -hmm. uh i mean if i'm playing a single player game obviously i don't have any of that necessarily um if i'm playing a game where you aren't shown stats um i can't think of one right off the top of my head um Maybe something like ESO when you're just sort of going in a dungeon. I don't yeah, think like, you get um, for instance, World of Warcraft or really any right. of the large MMOs where you may have to jump into dungeons. At the end of the dungeon, they're not going, okay, so this person got the most kills, this person got the most. Right. You which, can get extensions for it, but it's not actually in the game. Um, <laughs> at which point, of course, those in those games are like, you're too fucking slow, move fa faster. Why are we still at the beginning of, of, the, of the dungeon, right? So there, I feel like... Uh, it's not necessarily though just those numbers right because um as i had just mentioned you know like you can be in another kind of co-op or team game where people will still find something to yell about there's still something that you quote aren't doing right to their satisfaction or they are upset about something something right um and i wonder if uh this doesn't also a little bit tie into our um you know we sort of i feel like have a dual <laughs> A, a dual nature right on the one hand we are very social creatures we want to be part of something we want to belong to something we want to be part of a team but on the other hand um there are um you know a, a subset of people who also want to be first they want to be leaders they want to be you know uh, i want to be in the front and i want everybody to fawn over me right and that kind of goes against the whole team mentality in some ways because you can't be a support and also a leader right you you it's hard to do that. You you kind of have to be one or the other, especially in games where those are sort of like the defined roles, right? Like you've got your warriors and your tanks and your DPS and yeah. your healers and your this and that, right? Um, whereas in the in the real world, maybe you can be both, right? You can you can lead a team and still be part of the team. Uh, in games, it's very much like well, you have to pick a a role and then here's what's going to happen. And there's uh, there's time limits. There's loot limits there's points limit there's like a bunch of constraints i think that then we have to sort of both be a leader but also part of a team <laughs> and it's hard when you get a bunch of people who want to be first in a team right then mm -hmm. you're gonna um uh, and i think maybe one one thing that games could do is not necessarily do away with the point system or this and that because i think again like i was saying i, I think people are going to find something to yell about anyways right when they feel like it's not going to their the way that they want it to go is i think that they need to have a better system of of matching teams and i don't know what that would be i don't know what the answer is there uh but you know uh similar to how you know when when you want to get grouped up they ask you well do you want to be supported do you want to kill a bunch of shit but then a lot of people choose falsely <laughs> just so they can get into a group and then i think that's also when some of the problems arise and you've got a bunch of people who are like i'm the best and it's like Meh. um but i don't know what the i don't and i don't know what the answer to that would be but i think if if the group matching was better i think people would be better at everything as a team and have a better experience. Yeah, and I know Blizzard has said at least that they've tried doing it a little bit better when it comes to matchmaking, 
where they've said that, well, we're also going to look at your individual contribution in each match, at least for Heroes of the Storm. And so they've been trying to improve that system better, so that way you are matched up with people who um, may not be of the same mindset, of course, but are at least of the same type of level or play style. Mm. So that hopefully it gets rid of or mitigates some of the issues that we see arise, where they're like getting frustrated because they feel like people, certain people aren't putting in enough effort when really it's like they just don't know because... You know, maybe they just got lucky, got in a bunch of teams that won a ton right off the bat. And all of a sudden they're a higher ranking than what their knowledge base actually is. So, I mean, you know, that that happens or they're good with, you know, they're a one trick pony. They're really good with one character, but maybe they can't play that character suddenly. Or, you know, I mean, again, there's a lot of different situations that come up. Um I will say just to um, Lyft actually uses something like that um, kind of customized uh, matching, if you will. Um, I actually talked with a, a Lyft driver who said that uh, basically if you, you know, uh, if you're constantly being rated like five stars, uh, you're going to get paired up with other people who are also rated five stars. And this goes both for the driver and the person who's getting driven. Um, and that uh, one time he actually used, uh, you know, he let his friend use the lift or whatever you want know, to call the first friend. Um, but the, the friend kind of was shitty to the driver or something like that. So he got a bad rating. And after that, he was like a, a three or a four or something. And it was really hard for him to actually, when he used it for his own personal uh, to get picked up by someone, um, he kept getting matched up with drivers who were also rated three or four. And he mm. couldn't, he had to like work his way back up to five. Um, and I thought that was interesting because um, I had a pretty good rating in Lyft. And I, I always had really nice drivers. And I heard all these horror stories from, you know, some other people were like, oh, my driver sucked. And I'm like, I used Lyft almost exclusively for a few months every single day. And I constantly got really great drivers. They're all like basically five stars almost. And it, I just had such wonderful experiences. And I was like, listening to these people I'm like well, like I like why are you getting paired up with shitty drivers and it's like well Lyft's algorithm did that so that's kind of where I was thinking about you know if that group matching kind of worked a little better <laughs> but I don't know how that would you know necessarily work because I don't not want to put rating systems in place any more than they are already in the world because have you seen Black Mirror yeah that's terrifying. Uh, and also real quick, just to jump back into, into chat, because we've had a ton of awesome discussions happening as we've been going. Uh, for one, welcome Xiao to uh, chat. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Kiki Slider says, uh, this can come back to advertising too, the type of player you draw in with huge explosions and sick kills, <laughs> or more likely to draw more violent behaviors and put that in a violent setting and God knows what they'll say. That's true too. Again, it, it, you know what came first, the chicken or the egg? Was it the game trying to introduce the game to a specific group of people, or did the specific group of people kind of just attach themselves to the game? And a lot of times, it does have to do with marketing and advertising. Who you think your core demographic is, you're going to get. You know whether it works out for you or not. Um, we're also looking at uh, men during wartime have always done terrible things throughout history. It's fundamentally the same space. Exactly. It's like you're being put into war. And saying, all right, survive. And you're going to get competitive. You're going to get these survival kind of instincts kicking in. And, it's and it becomes us versus them, as we've been discussing. Um, when it when Ace is right, too, it is better just to help people. Again, and I think maybe it, it, would, might, it might actually be interesting to try to force people, even though they kind of already have to do that in the sense of... Um, Overwatch, you know, like you have to have a mercy, even with the nerf. A lot of times people are like, well, you have to have a mercy. And so there's been times where people don't play healers and have had to play a healer, right? But I think if like, for instance, you couldn't play, um, if there are ways where you couldn't play a specific character, but you had to heal or had to support, had to do something a little bit different than just blowing shit up, hopefully maybe that might instill something but i don't know because again like i've said people have been forced to have to play mercy have had a horrible time they you know were complaining and bitching and moaning to blizzard about it which i get don't get me wrong it's not that i don't get it you should never have to feel like you have to have that one character always to win a game um but yeah i think there, there might be something fundamentally to it depending on the style of game uh also uh Let's see here, kind of going through as we kind of skim through. Um, let's see here. I got so much better at Guild Wars 2 PvP because I found a girl who helped me understand the basics of a game. Yes, a girl. That's right, girls are out there. They play games too. <laughs> and there's a lot more of us that actually play games than we let on, let me tell you. <laughs> there's so many times where people are like, 
thanks, my dude. I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Kiki Slider says a lot of these players are teenagers and self involved young people and uncaring. Their experience is curated by them and someone who ruins that is infringing on their feeling of comfort, power, and safety. Exactly, right? Like, you want to go into a game to feel awesome, to feel great. And if you're losing, you technically don't feel great, right? Because you're not looking at it from, okay, well, how can I learn from this? How can I improve? This is this is a chance to actually learn and become better. They don't look at that. They just want the win. You know, that W is what matters. They don't care how they get the W a lot of times. It's just that they've received it. And a lot of times they don't even look at the win and go, okay, well, how did I win though? How, how, what made it so that way our team could win this match? in order again to self-improve. But again, that doesn't matter, right? Because it's all about the W or the L, the W or the L, not about how did we get to that point. But well, that I think is actually the most beneficial is how did we get it? What was the journey that we took to get to that point? So we can either recreate it or not do it again. Excuse me, not do it again. I was saying you, you hit up on a great point. That's kind of that's kind of the whole meaning of life, right? It's the journey. It's not the destination. <laughs> <laughs> And, and hey, Coco Covered, thank you for joining chat. How's it going, man? Good to see you. Um, agree with Kiki, says RX Mongo. Um, let's see, uh, Kindred Kumo says, I was playing with a group and we were losing four to five. I was pinging our Phoenix because he was playing Smite and a player thought I was pinging him. He goes, you, you're two out of eight with Odin, so shut your mouth. And I told him I wasn't pinging him, but our objective, but he wanted to get technical. We're, but you know, if you wanted to get technical, we're all getting our ass beat by four to five. So it's like, yeah, it doesn't matter the stats overall. The fact is that you're either still losing or still winning. And the fact is that, hey, you know, we, we need to, you know, fix it now. Rather than being stuck on stats or stuck on the fact of whether we are winning or losing, it's the fact of being in that current moment and handling what needs to be handled, which I think is, an, is another big thing. Um, let's see here as we go through any other things real quick. I just want to win games, but can't win them all exactly right <laughs> Thank you by the way for this amazing uh, comments everyone you Guys are so deep. I love it <laughs> uh, I could play ESO again by the way. I've been playing with that Final Fantasy. nice uh, People in WoW have no patience for someone who is learning a raid uh, raid leaders do not have the patience to help them their raiding team. They would much rather be the alpha male and scream at everyone. <laughs> I, I've definitely seen that. I totally get that, right? You know, just I'm going to give you a command and then you just do it. But it's like, well, wonder if you've never been there before. What do you do? Because there are specifics. There are they're making dungeons in in everything in certain MMOs a lot more specific to the team where it's like, okay, certain players have to stand here and certain players have to stand over there. And, and, you know, at this point in time, someone has to click this switch and, you know, pulls this lever, you know, like they're, they're becoming more, I, I guess, complex in a way. Right. And so you really need that teamwork and you really need to make sure that everyone understands it and that you are educating people on that and taking the time rather than just like, well, screw you. You don't know, get the hell out of here. I'll get someone that does like that doesn't work guys. <clears throat> and uh yeah exactly and kendrick kumo has a great point too if someone is going to spend money on a game like wow which again over 10 years old and they're still charging 15 dollars <laughs> per month let them play it and learn right it's their money being spent after all and even with a free game it's like just let people play the game they're not gonna be at your level necessarily when you're at your level like just chill yeah, you know, just a little bit of meditation or something. I don't know. Like, again, you started from not knowing it, too. Why are you getting worked up? It happens. If you're in a, such a big damn rush, don't play the game. Like, at that point in time, if it's like, oh, I need to pick up my kids in an hour, then don't play a freaking game where you have to raid and the raid takes two hours. Like, that's on you. That's not on anyone else. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, but unfortunately, again, we brush it off. We go, well, maybe I can fit it in. And then, oh, this person's delaying me. So I can't, nah, it's not how it works out, folks. Um, and let's see here. RX Mongo says, I can agree with your idea, Tatiana. Could it be possible to create a blocking system for people that say, do lie about the role they want to play? If that gets implemented, then the possibility of creating toxicity uh, gets mitigated. Instead of blocking people because they're pissed, create an atmosphere where people don't feel the need to be upset. That's interesting. I mean, I can see that, right? I mean, you and there are some reporting systems now that say, oh, well, they said they were going to be a support and they're not. Uh, they're not as prevalent of a reporting system. But I think overall, I think some of the problem, too, is that in, in a lot of games, when you block someone, you can still be grouped up with them. 
that's another issue. So that's if this fucked up. If this person is so <laughs> toxic and you wanted nothing to do with them because they were, you know, just threatening people left and right, and for whatever reason they're not banned or, or whatever, why are you being grouped up with them? Like that didn't work out to begin with. So these developers are just setting up matches to be basically dumpster fires. Because even <laughs> though you can't see what they're saying, there's still that issue. So why even be matched up with them in the first place? And if people don't get along, fuck it. And maybe some people will learn from banning so many people that, okay, maybe I shouldn't ban everyone because now I don't have anyone to play with, right? Well, yeah, and I think that's potentially also the <clears throat> the problem that uh, these game developers don't want to have, right? Like, well, if we ban everybody, then we don't have anybody playing our game. <laughs> and it'll be harder to find matches and, and all that other stuff. Like, um, who was it? They just banned, was it PUBG? They banned like a million people or something. Yeah, within, uh, it was like two months ago or something. I think it was yeah. in January or, uh, I, yeah, I think January actually, where they banned a million people. Now, mind you, that was for hacking and cheating. And oh, a lot of these accounts were, so, yeah, it wasn't for being toxic. No, no, no. <laughs> it was because they were manipulating the game code. And, uh, and so they, of course, didn't want to deal with that toxicity, whatever. But, you know, they deal with, uh, you know, changing up the code and cheating the system a little bit. Bam. So it's like the developers could do this, right? They honestly could. <laughs> they just don't want to. And and that's the the uh, problem, unfortunately. Right, because nobody would buy buying their games, right? Like like Kiki says, fuck it, ban everybody. There's no games for anyone. <laughs> it's like that parent, you know, takes away all the all the games from the kid and like, well see what you made me do. See what you made me do. <laughs> Uh, and I feel like we've we've talked a lot about um, essentially almost the same topic uh, this entire episode. And uh, to continue on with that, uh, with video game industry, with the video game industry and politics, talking about vi violent games making people act violent? Question uh, mark. And that's what the Trump administration wants you to believe. But I feel like a lot of the administrations in the past want basically you're saying the same thing and that's just not true right um so uh most recently uh there was of course a school shooting in parkland florida and um it it actually is one of the world's deadliest school massacres because 17 people were killed and 16 more were injured so obviously the trump administration was you know <coughs> people turning to them like oh you got to do something about you know uh this violence this and that and Trump held a meeting on school safety and said that we have to look at the internet, what's being provided to our children, and of course, <gasps> video games. <laughs> yeah, didn't we see this during Columbine and everything else? Like Every early 90s, time. mid 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, this has always been a, an attacking point because they want to avoid just, you know, better regulations on guns. Not harder regulations, just better regulations on guns. Yeah, and in, uh, in January 2013, <coughs> following Sandy Hook, um, there are actually um, reps from, from the game industry that met um, with the Gun Violence Commission and then Vice President Joe, Joe, uh, Joe Biden to, to like talk again about this violence thing. And it's, it, it's, it's crazy, right? Because uh, these, these games that are coming out, they're not coming out just in the US, right? They get distributed worldwide. Yeah. But when we look at, um, you know, uh, overall gun, gun violence, violence in the U.S. is it, it's exponentially higher than in the U.S. than in any other country, right? So it's not just the video games, right? And it's not just what's available on the internet because again, the internet is also pretty much available a worldwide. And. Um, now, of course, m m uh, so most recently, uh, you know, uh, as of March 1st, it was announced that Trump was going to meet, you know, next week with the leaders of video game industry to see what could be done, which comes came as a surprise, of course, to the uh, to the biggest companies in the video game industry, because one, uh, they were never told about this meeting. <laughs> so how could they attend it? Um, and... <laughs> Uh, the Entertainment Software Association, the, the ESA, which is a group that represents companies like EA, Capcom, Square Enix, Microsoft, etc. Um, they actually responded with a statement uh, that both denied knowledge of that meeting and also, of course, pushed back against its premise. Right. Like, why, why are we meeting to talk about this? Video games don't make people violent, um, essentially. And. Uh, 
now I think that they actually, uh, as of March 5th, a, a meeting was confirmed <laughs> for March 8th, which is tomorrow, uh, where apparently now uh, the the gaming industry overlords are, are going to meet with Trump and his team and, I don't know, have some cookies and tea and chat about life, I guess. Um, but, like, <laughs> so I guess some, some of the, uh, you know, some of the questions here are... Uh, to kind of follow on what we've been talking about, you know, are, are games the root of violence? You know, uh, are games the root of toxicity? Um, you know, the basically video game, video games that ha that you know are quote unquote violent, uh, which is the majority of them, right? Because you need a conflict to solve, and most easily that conflict is solvable through well, we have got to take out these uh, these targets. Um, but video games like keep getting attacked and saying that, oh, they're making our kids violent and that's why we have school shootings, right? Where, you know, is this a real distraction though from the real issue of, of guns and, and gun control and, and just mental health issues and uh, really everything else except for video games <laughs> at this point, right? Like we were talking about earlier, you know, um, the, the people that play these games and bring this toxicity you know, how, how do, why do they do that? How, how do they learn to do that? Why can't, you know, like we need to teach them more com effective communication. We need to teach, teach them empathy. We need to teach them, uh, all, all sorts of things. Right. And that starts, uh, at home that starts in the school, uh, that starts elsewhere, not inside the video game. Right. Um, uh, me playing a video game isn't going to, you know, if I'm not already violent towards other people, it's not going to make me more violent. If anything, um, it's going to potentially help me release some of the anger <laughs> and, and, and provide a, a place of catharsis. I don't know. What are your thoughts? I, I, I get it's it's so hard for me to talk about this because I see so much wrong in the school systems in the U.S. Um, and again, having come from a different country where I've experienced a school system that was, um, you know, had a lot of discipline and... Uh, was in some ways more restrictive than the U.S. Um, it, at the same time, I felt like we were, n in a way, nurtured there more if my, from my limited experience. And I came here, and it feels a little bit like these games. It feels very competitive. Uh, it feels like, you know, uh, teachers and school systems don't have the funding necessary um, and also don't have the respect necessary uh, of, like, what they have to do and, and how they're basically bringing up the next generation of people. Um, but then also in the home, you know, there's very, I, I don't, you know, I think there could be more support for uh, children, uh, families, and, um, and, and the parents, you know, and educating everybody on a lot of different things that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, well, and, you know, so yeah, this, this meeting is happening tomorrow, March 8th. And as you mentioned, too, it's like, what are they going to do? Just like over tea and cookies, just start talking about it and be like, yes, you know, we're going to have White House representatives going, well, yeah, you know, so, uh, you know, violence in games and gaming industry is going to be like, yeah, you mean the same games that are released to Canada, released to Mexico, released to every other place. And yet our gun violence is the one that's increasing. And there was a great point to be made in one of the articles that we looked at for this, which is they said that one of the large, the biggest supports for the ESA is the Entertainment Software Rating Board, or the ESRB, which was established in 1994, ironically the same year as the Federal Assault Weapons Ban, which Congress happened to allow to expire in 2004. Uh, but it, when that went into effect, and the ESRB's rating system is applied to all games sold in the U.S., and the Federal Trade Commission has shown it to actually be successful at keeping most mature games out of the hands of children. Again, because it's allowing parents who might not be hip or cool with it to actually understand the rating and what's in the content that their child could p potentially be involved with or possess. Um... And it keeps children just from going up to a cashier and saying, here, I want to buy this, right? So there are some obstacles. So they've made it a little bit more difficult. And they said it has actually helped. And so for them to say, oh, well, it's video games, it's just an easy way out. Because as, as someone mentioned in chat too, that um, the gaming industry doesn't have the same amount of clout 
in the in U.S. politics as, let's be honest, the NRA and other gun lobbyists and gun associations and things like that. So, you know, what's easier to go up against? Uh, someone who happens to just utilize guns in their storytelling, if you will. So, because again, that's what it is. It's really just storytelling. Um, or, you know, are you going to go after the people who are highly involved, who are funding your campaigns and say, you've got to put, you know, harder regulations on drugs or, or on guns or not even harder regulations, but more specific regulations, especially for those who, who, for instance, are mentally unstable and should not get access to guns. I mean, again, this this is a reality of it. And I think instead, again, they're going after, as you said, a minor target in front of them, basically taking the path of least resistance and saying, oh, well, we tried. Oh, well, we've talked, you know, and things will get better now in hopes that people go, OK, great. There's been a step forward. You know, we've had this kind of catharsis moment and, you know, they you know, it, it's being resolved. So we'll let them handle it now because it's not going to get handled. That's the whole thing. I mean, if anything, this is smoke and mirrors bullshit i mean that in my personal opinion that's what it is it's just smoke and mirrors bullshit to try to cover up the real issue and again we've been talking about this the whole entire uh, uh show here has been like that whole concept of well what's really the problem is it you know the the thing in front of me or is it the thing that's that's you know way down at the end here and what am i really going to go after is it going to be the thing here that just happens to be in my way or happens to have a, a loose association or should I go after the heart of the problem? You know, if you, if you have a cold, you know, you're going to take care of it, right? You're not going to say, oh, well, you know, colds happen. I'm just going to walk around and stay sick and not try to do anything to alleviate it. You know, I'm not going to take my, I don't know, glass of orange juice or my this or that, right? Because then all you're going to do is get, just get sicker and get worse. So instead of not doing anything about it, why don't we go to the heart of the problem? But again, politicians, the government overall doesn't want to. So this is the easiest route to go about. And yeah, actually, and it was George. And by the way, welcome, George. Great to see you, man. How are you doing today? Uh, he had brought that up as well as it's frustrating because there are real issues with the way that video games affect people that only get brought up when someone wants to blame video games for school shootings. Um, and Kendra Kumo does say, too, I don't recall uh, when... Uh, excuse me, when uh, they came out with a school shooting simulator. Exactly right. There is more thought to this than just what a video game can give. I mean, these kids in these school shootings really planned it out. They went, okay, this is where the security is. These are where people are typically during the day. Uh, these are when these classes are in session or what's happening, when these people are on lunch break, when these people aren't on lunch break. This is how I can purchase a gun. Because again, in these games too, they don't tell you how to purchase a gun or how to find a gun and use it right they don't train you for that they just basically say you know hey you're a soldier in the war and hey you have a gun so i mean that's all kind of just there but you know the real specifics of it that's not being fed through these video games at all you know so these kids are literally just researching it because they want to do it they want to do it bad enough that they put the time and effort into it like you would any other thing and that's scary to think about right uh, so again, you can't blame video games for that. That's just the individual person. Yeah, because like if somebody is truly violent and they play a game where they're shooting up a bunch of people and then they go and they try to get a gun and they can't, they're not going to go then go get a bunch of really sharp knives and go stabby stabby in the school. Right? Like if they don't have access to that gun, they're probably not going to do the other thing. Or if they if they do... They're sure as fuck not going to kill that many people. Well, and, you know, people will say, too, why do they choose a gun over just a knife? And the thing is, too, is that the reason why a lot of these kids choose a gun is because they can do the most damage. They know they can. They can take out the most people the quickest before they potentially, uh, you know, either end their own life there. Or if they feel like, OK, well, I need an escape route. And if I have to fight against police officers or security with weapons there, a gun is going to be a lot easier than a knife. Right. And you got range on that, too. You got range. Exactly. So it gives you time where if you did want to run away, you could. Though a lot of times, it most of the time, it doesn't work out like that. They either get done, gunned down by police in a gunfight or they take their own lives. And I'm not saying, you know, take guns away from people. First of all, why do you need an assault rifle? What are you, what are you hunting with an assault rifle? Like, you don't need that for hunting. Uh, you don't need that to protect your 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 property like 
like who like what from a horde of zombies like <laughs> that that's been my other thing too it's like why are these things just being sold to like anybody like what is up with that what is up with that well and you know people go back to the constitution but you know they tend to manipulate the meaning behind the constitution for instance people say yes. freedom of speech but that freedom of speech is actually only meant for those who speak out against the government they they then say that oh well you you know the government cannot then uh, introduce any repercussions for you speaking out against them right. um also the same thing with bearing arms again that was during the time where um you know they were dealing these militias and these minutemen were dealing with uh soldiers coming in from another country and so you know that country being england was trying to take away their arms so they couldn't protect themselves this is a different situation though that was one government or one system um, trying to implement themselves on a now newly formed system or attempted uh, newly formed system and this but in this situation it's not that we're not worried about you know Britain coming over and saying okay this is how we're gonna do things now again we're back bitches and we're back with a vengeance <laughs> like you know they're not trying to say okay we're gonna implement a parliamentary system whether you like it or not and we're gonna take away your weapons so you can't defend yourselves that's not the situation here and so, but people get so worked up and say, oh, well, you're taking away my guns now. You're making it harder. Well, you know what? This is the thing. If you're implementing new regulations that help it so that way those who are mentally unstable do not get a gun, why are you bitching? Because then that then at least hints to me that maybe you are one of those people that are mentally unstable and need to really get help. And again, it's, I'm not saying that in the sense of, uh, you know, bashing people who face, the, you know, mental obstacles by any shake of a stick. I got some of my own. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm one to talk, right? But uh, what I'm saying, though, is the fact that, you know, if you're getting worked up about it, but yet you're perfectly fine and, you know, and everything else, then what's the big issue? Like, why are you so concerned then? Are you concerned about discovering something about yourself maybe you didn't realize? Like, mm -hmm. you know, the, again, there's something else there besides the real issue of, well, you're trying to take guns from me. Well, no, no one's saying that. At least I'm not. I mean, you know, there are groups of people that say, you know, we're not trying to take guns from you. We just don't want it in the hands of that person who's, you know, looking to kill everyone. You know, you can own them. You can collect them. Again, people collect samurai swords. You know, they look at the art of it. They look at the engineering behind it. I get that. That's totally fine. Like, I, I understand that. Though, should you really have an AR-15 or something like that? Or, you know, eh, you know, you know, someone pisses you off the wrong day and all of a sudden, you know, that's a little bit scarier. But, you know, I, I get the understanding of, of wanting to collect. I get the understanding of appreciating it. In, in a certain sense but if you're appreciating it for mass destruction you shouldn't have access to those things that's a different kind of appreciation that you know we don't need to to introduce basically is what i'm saying because we have to think about not just an individual's rights but everyone's rights if those people are willing to take a life they're taking the rights of those people to live so which one do you want to pick? Do you want to pick the fact that, well, we can't take away the rights of these gun owners, even though they are mentally unstable and they could go off at any minute? Or do we want to say, well, I mean, this person's life doesn't really matter. I mean, and that's up to our politicians. So far, they've been choosing that, you know, guns are more important than someone's life. Yeah, and I've seen some talk around people saying like, oh, well, we just need to train our teachers to be more vigilant and maybe give them some guns and this and this and that. And I'm like, all right, you want somebody who's working basically like less than minimum wage if you look at the tired time that they spend on kids and, and working and what they get paid. You want to now like have them be fucking SWAT teams? Like, what is wrong with people? Like, let our teachers be fucking teachers. Like, give them funding to not be overworked and 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 stressed out and underfunded uh, so that they can do their job properly give our schools the ability like the support and the ability to uh teach kids how to be uh, you know more positive social behaviors um help them with mental health issues um help the parents who maybe are single parent homes or uh, both parents are working or they don't really have a support network like not don't fucking teach them how to wield a gun like i listen to some of this logic and i'm like y'all are fucking crazy batshit crazy and i'm okay with saying that because i think that they are because that's 
that's ridiculous. That doesn't solve anything at all. It just aggravates the problem. And you know what else it does? It puts more money into uh, the bank accounts of uh, gun companies and their shareholders. Yeah, I mean, they live off fear. Again, it's a known fact. Every single time there's a school shooting or any type of shooting, boom, gun sales go through the roof. Uh, I mean, in a sad way, this is what they hope for. If you don't believe that gun companies don't look at the value of a life, look at the Ford Pinto. Don't laugh too hard, but look at the Ford Pinto. Now, there was a severe issue with the design of the Ford Pinto when it first came out. They actually put the gas um, container basically in the back end of the car or more toward the back end of the car. So when people got into car accidents, they would hit that, it would ignite, and that car became a freaking ticking time bomb, basically. And it put a lot of people at risk. And a lot of people did die from car accidents because of it. But, you know, the, the Ford company actually looked at it at that time and went, okay, well, what's the cost of a human life? Because, you know, do we really want to have to, you know, pull all these cars off the road and redesign it and then put it back out there and take the PR hit and everything else, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, for a bit they went, you know what, actually it's just cheaper to just be taken to court and pay the families off for the loss of their loved one. They yeah. actually put a value on someone's life and they said it wasn't valuable enough to them. And if you think things have changed a hell of a lot now in 2018, again, as we talked about in the uh, first section of our show, there's still racism, there's still sexism, there's still all this bullshit my dick is bigger than yours and all this other pissing contest stuff that's happening. So if you really think we're adva too advanced, maybe you should reevaluate. It's still here. It ain't going to change. Um, so again, this is something that we need to look into. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm so frustrated at the fact that we still have to talk about this stuff and that video games get blamed for it. It's just so damn frustrating. Yeah. And, and, you know, <clears throat> and I know that politicians are like, oh man, you know, this is a tough this is a tough issue. We don't know how to fix it. Let's, uh, I don't know, let's meet with a bunch of people and talk. And you know what? A bunch of professors from universities around the U.S. got together and in basically about two weeks, just conversing online, they came up with the eight-point call to action to prevent gun violence in the United States of America. Um, it's available as a PDF. It's on a website. They started out like as a Google Doc. And they came together and they actually found something that, resembles a solution uh you know and and they uh, will be able to uh will be sure to link this to in um wherever you can hear this uh <laughs> this podcast and watch this vod um but basically they talk about instead of focusing on making things harder we need to make things softer and what that means is it's not about putting more security measures it's not about giving teachers guns it's not about this this and that um we need to start early on um, we need to maintain physically and emotionally safe conditions and positive school environments that protect all students and adults from bullying, discrimination, harassment, and assault. Um, they need to have adequate staffing like counselors, like psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, um, and coordinated school and community-based mental health services for individuals with risk factors for violence um, and, and recognizing that violence is not intrinsically a product of mental illness either. Um, reforming school discipline to reduce, um, uh, you know, uh, exclusionary, exclusionary practices and, and instead foster positive social, behavioral, emotional, and academic success for students. Um, and then, you know, also have... Um, more national programs um, that uh, include practical channels of communications for persons to report potential threats, um, as well as interventions to resolve conflicts, assist troubled individuals. And yes, banning assault style weapons, uh, high capacity ammunition clips, basically things that can be used by someone to kill a massive amount of people at the same time um, and, and stuff like that. So they, they've put together this whole list and, and they, they even prioritize it as like, you know, what's doable now, what's doable later, uh, this and that. And it, it is up to the federal and state authorities to take immediate action, right? It, it's, and I know there's some people out there who are like, let's not have the government, you know, we don't need the government to be any more involved in our lives than, than not. Uh, here's the thing. If you're a parent and, and you're taking care of your child, you fucking get, get involved in that child's life. 
You know what I mean? If the, if you see them going towards a burning flame on the gas stove, you're not going to be like, oh, you know what? I should let my child like figure shit out by themselves. No, you know that that's bad. And it's not saying that they can make they can't go and make themselves a, a, a pot of tea on on the stove. But it's like, hey, don't fucking touch the stove. You're going to get burned. <laughs> you know, you still uh, as a person of authority need to be able to implement certain things until you you understand that your child understands the difference between using the stove for tea and using the stove to burn themselves and i will link that in chat <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh actually uh george makes a great point too uh there was a, just a teacher in florida who admitted to trying to inject white supremacist ideals into her classrooms uh and uh, I don't want that teacher to have a gun in the classroom. Again, not saying that white supremacism automatically leads to guns, but it has led to definitely violence and a lot of other questionable things. Um, yeah, I, but you know, to, what we're really saying here is always, we don't want someone who's like saying, hey, we should kill Jewish people, we should kill black people, and then give them a gun. So that, that way they can actually do it. Because if they're already talking about killing people or exterminating a certain group of people, why are we giving them the the tools to do so then like that's really what we're doing here so i mean that's that's a huge issue as well and uh kendrick kumo says well you can blame the nra for that giving people the idea that introducing guns to early ages is a good idea to avoid guns being used by said individuals so basically like well if we if you introduce them early enough in their life they'll understand it and they'll implement it and not abuse it Really? Because that's what we're doing with technology and kids are really abusing technology and the parents are letting them abuse technology. And, you know, really weapons over time, that is a technology. We've seen them grow and expand and evolve uh, to become all of a sudden, you know, massive weapons of destruction. So how are we surprised that it's going to happen with guns as well? I, I, I just, the, 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 the sense of connection or the lacking of for many people is just astonishing. And it really scares, it can scare you, you know, and it's, and I guess though, the goal is though not to be scared, but to then say, okay, let's do something. It's not to hide with your head in the sand. It's not to lock yourself in your home for the rest of your life and just, you know, <laughs> order from Amazon Prime and from Grubhub, but it's actually to go out there and do something or support those who are doing something and getting your facts straight too. you know, not, not getting worked up over, you know, a news story, but really looking into that news story. That's why it's like, you know, for the stuff that we're saying, please don't just get thoroughly worked up about it and pissed off and then write a blog article about it. Unless you have other information to help back up what we're saying too. Again, we, we look through, we research everything as best as we can, but we're only two people, right? And you know, our, our goal is to try to help get this information to you and you come up with your own, um, end goal basically from it you know you you come up with your own um understanding and processing of it and, and you implement it the way you need to so i mean again it's on you in the end but really like anything else just research it look into it a little bit more too um and that's really the biggest thing i can say about any of this information that comes out whether it's pro-gun or anti-gun look at the full picture as best as you can as as clear as you can um, but yeah, so, you know, with, with the gun situation, I think we're in agreement of like, yeah, teachers should not have guns. It's not going to help the situation. Right. What there, is that? <laughs> there was even a story recently that I saw, um, and I don't know hundred percent how true it is, but I do just want to share it and you could take it with a grain of salt <clears throat> is, um, there is something going around about how there was actually a, a police officer there on site. And, uh, during the Parkland shooting and they didn't go in. They heard the guns go off and they were scared shitless basically. They didn't know what to do, how to react. Plus the problem is, is in a situation like that, you don't want to accidentally shoot the wrong kid. You know, you don't want to have to shoot the one kid that's guilty and then it also, you, you accidentally end up shooting someone else. Um, or, you know, you, you think someone has a weapon because you go in there afraid already and boom, they shoot another kid. So it's like, I, I get that to respect. It's like, it's their job to serve and protect. But at the same time, yeah, you do worry about your own life. And if you have a family and kids, and you also worry about 
killing the wrong damn kid. Like you don't want to do that. And you don't want that on your conscience. But at the same time, yeah, this, this kid is killing other kids. So it's like, it is this huge kind of moral dilemma in a way. And especially when you're stuck in that specific situation and, and none of us can really speak for that person because we're not there. And so many times there's people that talk tough and say, well, I'd go in there yeah. with a shotgun and an AK-47. I'd kick that kid's ass. Da -da 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 -da. And it's like, really? Okay, well, I don't know. Get involved in the situation. See if you can say it then. I mean, it's just like this whole Monday night quarterback stuff from the couch where people are like, why didn't the quarterback pass the ball to this guy who's clearly, clearly open? Oh, you mean because the quarterback had a six foot five guy right in front of him and couldn't see over or around him? Like, you know, th this is the situation. And one cop, and George puts it great too, his job shouldn't be to stop mass shooters. His job should be to act as a deterrent. And, you know, so with these mass shooters, it's not the, the police officer's job at that time to say, okay, I'm going to now stop the accessibility of guns to children. I'm going to do all this other stuff, right? Like, it's our government's job. But again, it's always trying to find a scapegoat to distract people from what the true issue is. And that's what I'm seeing here. Right. Well, I mean, if, if teachers are going to have guns and that, that police officer should be also stopping mass shooters. I mean, duh. It, totally logical <laughs> sarcasm um <laughs> well especially too let's say here police officers a lot of times have like what like a glock nine so it's like just a pistol you're going up against someone with a freaking machine gun let's say like semi-automatic fully automatic again depending on what state they're in and what have you if they have access to that i don't care like the yes the cop has a bulletproof vest that doesn't mean they don't feel the pain and they don't get hit by the propulsion or the energy of those bullets and get sent to the ground and get the air knocked out of them and then they get shot in the head right and like, then they're not helping anybody yeah it's like either they go in they charge in make the situation worse potentially kill a few innocent kids like again people always say well wonder if people had guns they either wouldn't do shit because they'd be so damn scared of the situation or they'd end up shooting someone who didn't deserve to be shot in the first place. Well, and people responding to crisis situations, it, it, it takes practice. You can't just have, you know, one self-defense class and boom, you're like gonna fight off and be a vigilante crime fighter. Um, it's the same thing with guns, with any sort of crisis, uh, uh, EMTs, right? Like all of this stuff, like you, you require training. And there's a whole episode I think we can do on the training of police officers, but we won't talk, get into that right now. Um, but there's so many, you can't just respond to crisis situation and think that you're going to be calm the way that you are now on the couch doing the Monday, Monday night quarterbacking. Uh, when you're in the actual moment, you're going to be fucking emotional as fuck. And then who knows how you're going to actually respond, especially if you don't have training. Because even people with training respond sometimes. You're like, ah, oh, that was not good. <laughs> that did not work out well. Um... So, yeah, I, I'm also sick of the people who, who think that they're going to react a certain way in a certain situation. I don't know what the fuck I would do if I was in that situation. I'll tell you that right now. I would hope that I would react in, in a way that was for the better of everyone and everyone got out safe and blah, 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 blah. But I don't know. I might just be cowering on the floor crying. Uh, maybe I will be a hero and save everyone. Who knows? Like, it's hard to tell if you're not in that situation. And hopefully like, nobody else nobody gets into that situation doesn't have to be there but oh yeah well and, and uh Kidri Kumo says you know the bulletproof vest only protects against so much and not to mention it doesn't protect your limbs doesn't protect your head so if you get incapacitated you can't do shit anyway and now this person is even more agitated on edge who has this weapon because now they see a police officer they know the police are here potentially or that they're coming and that just incites even more violence at that point in time uh, and then George says too, it doesn't matter how trained you are, or how armed if, that you are. If you go into a situation where there is a surprise shooter, you're likely to get killed and you're likely to potentially get other people killed as well. Again, with hostage situations, what do you typically have? You don't send guns blazing in, right? Typically with a hostage situation, you send in a negotiator. That's the whole point of a negotiator's job. But again, these kids who do school shootings, they don't want to be negotiated with. They don't care. Now, maybe at the end, they'll regret it and go, oh, shit, what am I doing? I mean, you know, my, maybe they might take a negotiator then. But still, at that point in time, they're so worked up and afraid because these are kids, too, that they're just going to shoot anything that moves. They're, they're in fight or flight, and people don't understand that. The logic part of the brain goes out the window when you're in really just 
scary freaking situations. So it's gonna get to the point where it's fight or flight. I either run or I mow everyone down. And that's from both the police officers involved, the teachers involved, the students, but also then also the shooters. So it, it, everything is happening all at once. And you know, it is true that because we're social creatures, we do get that sense. We can easily from other people pick up anger. If they're angry, that puts us in a foul mood. If they're scared, that puts us in an un, ed, you know, an on edge mood. And so now think about being in a school of 300 people or, or a thousand people who are now on edge, scared shitless. You hear cries, you hear screams, you hear wailing, all this stuff. And now suddenly you're supposed to be Mr. Badass Duke Nukem busting down a door and, and blasting this kid? No, that's not going to happen. It's not that simple. It's not that black and white. Um, but I mean, I, I, I do assume that if we sent in William Shatner as the negotiator, I mean, maybe something good would happen. It would, it would ha with all those pauses, though, I mean, you're looking at at least like 20, 30 minutes of just him trying to get the first sentence out of his mouth. Um. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for for all the all the good commentary. Um, I know it's a it's a heavy topic, and um, unfortunately, there is no short term solution. Um, it is a um, it, it is something that I I think you know one meeting with the video game industry isn't going to solve it all, <laughs> or solve um, anything at all, for that matter. So hopefully, uh, you know, some of these uh, university professors, I know they're getting uh, a little bit of, uh, of forward momentum with this document they came up with. So um, I'm hoping, you know, more politicians will see this, um, more authorities will see this, more local and, and you know, state, a local and federal government will, um, will take heed and actually try to solve the problem. Uh, and not just put a Band-Aid solution on it. Well, and the biggest thing too with that is not even, let's not hope. Let's not hope they see this. Seriously, let's ourselves take action and let's email it to our representatives. Let's call our representatives, leave a voicemail and read this document off to them and let them know that my dollars will not support your campaign. My dollars, my vote will not go to you unless you protect the people which is your job in the first place we've got to again because that if we if we put it on in that in those terms we're giving them that that sort of respect and, and authority that they have not proven that they deserve and and that's in my eyes what it's like again we, we you know again taught from a very early age that hey these people are in these positions so they should be respected and they shouldn't be questioned because they have our best interests at heart we're now learning which again has been this way for decades now they don't have our best interest always at heart and a lot of times vote against our interests so it's really important that we don't just hope but that we do some because we tell them we don't care about your hopes and prayers freaking do something well we can't just say then well i hope they do something we've got to do something so that they do something we've got to be the first domino that knocks down all the rest of the dominoes that way this whole event takes place that this whole action takes pla place of getting change because yeah otherwise yeah don't let your representatives win by default twitter email handwritten letters showing up to their office, whatever you can do. If you believe in this and you believe this is a big enough issue, you know, call, set, uh, sign petitions, everything that you can do, help out in some way. Uh, that's gonna be really the important thing instead of just hoping. True that, true that. Um, and just to quickly wrap up um, our show today, I uh, wanted to just quickly uh, either remind you or let you know if you haven't already heard that uh, TwitchCon uh, the fourth TwitchCon is coming to the Bay Area this year. Uh, Twitch has announced this just very recently. Um, tickets are not up for sale quite yet, uh, but they did announce that uh, the TwitchCon 2018 will be held from October 26 to October 28 at the San Jose McEnery Convention Center. Um, just a skip, hop, and a jump away from their uh, <laughs> Bay Area headquarters of Twitch. Um, and uh, in 2017, they actually uh, estimated about 50,000 people showed up. Uh, and that's really, a t it's actually a 25% growth over the year before that, which was 25% growth over the year before that. So um, it'll be exciting to see uh, how many people show up at TwitchCon this year and what they have in store for us. Um, I will say we went to the TwitchCon 2017 and it was a blast. Um, it, they had a lot of different 
little sections that uh, that were really awesome. Uh, you know, first of course they had the the big companies, <laughs> all the big game com- the companies with their. Well, be, before we get thing. too hard, we might have listeners who might not know what TwitchCon is either. Oh, Just because yes. we're on Twitch, but we do have people that do listen that aren't on Twitch that may not understand what TwitchCon is. Good point. Um, so if you want to hit on that too. Uh, TwitchCon is a yearly uh, conference convention um, that is for streamers on Twitch, um, but it's also for gamers, uh, for the fans, um, and uh, for esports. It, it's uh, kind of a a whole lot of people but the focus is um is on the on the casters themselves the streamers um and and the fans who watch them their audience but if you're into gaming they have a lot of good game stuff um uh for example last year they actually had an indie corner quote unquote corner it was like a pretty big section um where they were showing up uh, indie games that were in development uh you got to actually even play them uh we actually met uh two awesome people uh, uh playing uh, uh, in that in that space um and then they also had creatives uh creative streamers as well um showcasing their wares showcasing their creative sides um you're able to purchase things from there but also interact with these people and and really um get a sense of twitch not only as uh you know a, a, a stream streaming gaming pl- platform, uh, but also uh, the broader platform that it's trying to be, um, where you had your IRL streamers, your creatives, um, your music, uh, graphic design, all that good stuff. Um, and it, it was, I just, I loved the fact that um, up and coming gaming, uh, game develop companies were able to showcase their games i thought that was that was my favorite part um because you know you go to some of these events like pax or um i can't think of games con yeah all of these different gaming conventions where you know blizzard is there ea is there microsoft is there you know all the big names are there but the but the the smaller uh, companies don't get represented because, you know, they couldn't afford uh, the, the space or something, or, or they don't even have that kind of a platform available to them. Or they don't um, have that big of a space. I mean, we have been to some conferences or conventions where they did have like an indie corner, but everything was like so tight and small and they oh, were just kind yes. of shoved into a corner because it's like, well, you didn't pay the budget to get the big deal location, so screw you. Yeah. Um, so that's really cool. Um, I will say, though, that, you know, <laughs> the feedback that I gave TwitchCon for last year was um, maybe a little less on the bigger companies. <laughs> I, I know they're probably paying a lot of your bills, but maybe just just tone it down a notch and bring up the other people. Um, as I do remember going in the creative co- corner quote unquote again uh, as they call them um and it was yeah it was so tightly packed I, it was like you were just like right next to everybody and it's like these people are doing amazing things um and they're and they're helping bring a new type of audience um to twitch so like you know give them a little bit more space give them a little bit more um more area to work with and um again twitch is about community right that at least that's what they say uh so if you are about community really showcase your community even more so i'm hoping that they'll do that this year but we'll we'll see um i'm still super super excited um they have uh of course um a link up already for for twitchconhotels.com uh where you can you know get a discount and whatnots and and book your hotel rooms there i will say though though those prices seem a little bit inflated so we actually recommend checking out something like airbnb um we actually just booked ours for for it as well um and you get to experience san jose and the surrounding areas a little bit more actually and and get to um hopefully save some money as well um with that also yeah and um you know with that too we, we also noticed too that with some of the hotel prices i mean some of them were a bit higher up uh, 150 160 170 dollars when per we night. found <laughs> per night when we found other ones actually for about 120 to 113 per night um and they were fairly close to the location so i would say just kind of look around and see what works best for you um you know with with events like this now last year what was it 170 per ticket 196 per uh ticket? it was 185 last year for a three-day pass for a three-day pass so yeah so you know it's hard to say what the prices will be it'll either be the same price or more expensive now the san jose convention center ironically is a little bit smaller of a location than the long beach convention center is 
So that's interesting too, um, because again, if they are experiencing a lot of growth, and I, and I, there's nothing behind this, but it's just that it's just interesting to think about that. Um, you know, they're putting it in a smaller location or a smaller venue, yet they're getting more people. So it'll be interesting to see overall how it works out. With 2017, there were some complaints with the length of lines to get into specific events and everything. So I don't know if maybe they're hoping to mitigate it by putting it into a little bit of a smaller space, which means a little bit less people. Mm. I, I, I'm not really sure. It, it, it's hard to say, and it's hard to say what ticket prices will be, but you're looking at probably for a three-day pass, at least around 185 um, be, when it's all said and done, at least. Right. Um, also, too, again, if you are getting hotels, a lot of them are already getting booked up, which is why we also recommend the Airbnb. It might be a little bit easier to find a place so that way you can attend TwitchCon 2018. Um, and there's a lot to do, both in San Jose, and you're not that far from San Francisco either. So, you know, there's, there's plenty to see and do. There's a pretty okay uh, transit system in the area, but you might have to rely on a Lyft as well or an Uber um, just to get around a little bit quicker. It's just a little bit easier that way. Um, other than that, though, it should be interesting. They haven't really announced anything else like who will the vendors be or the exhibitors will be, um, you know, what kind of talks or, or, or whatnot they'll have. Because last year and the years prior, they've been doing a lot of these um, discussion panels where it's especially more geared toward start, you know, people that are interested in casting or those interested in um, growing as a caster, or as a streamer. And so it's been very interesting. We, we again went last year, attended as many as we could every single day. And I mean, they were, some were great, some were, yeah, it could have been better, but I, at least they attempted it. And I appreciate the fact that they were trying to get a, a talk back or a discussion panel on that specific subject. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this year, looking forward to see what they offer the community in that respects and, uh, you know, who they have there and how we can connect and network and, 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 you know, work with other companies and other developers and other streamers to help each other grow, right? Because um, that's going to be the real core of it because no one's an island. No one's going to survive on their own. And it's really, you know, really important to connect where you can and, and you know, and make uh, a win-win situation for everyone involved. Indeed. I hope they plan out the TwitchCon party better. <laughs> Yeah, I know that I was uh, that was a big thing for a lot of people. This is some people didn't even get in because it was so packed, and yeah, it was uh, it it was hellish for some people. We didn't we didn't attend that though. We just said it's probably going to be hellish. We set that standard up and just got the hell out. <laughs> uh, and Dengi says I, I will be out there, but I'm saving my pennies to actually move out to that area and hopefully can make it out someday. That is an that is an awesome goal um, for sure. Um, totally respect that <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll see how much um like i said uh, tickets haven't been <clears throat> uh released yet so we, we're not sure exactly but uh probably definitely upwards of 150 for sure for three days exactly and actually too just to let you know uh with this show with this stream uh you know we do live streaming Every Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday, our Wednesdays are talk show, which hits on left and right brain topics such as today. And sometimes we even have themes like this video game theme for today. Uh, other days we do game streams. We have single player Sundays where we play games like Final Fantasy. Uh, we have Fighting Fridays where, where we will play games like Doom or, or you know, uh, was it Hyper Universe we've been playing recently or Heroes of the Storm. Mellow Mondays where we do more chilled, you know, laid back strategy based games like Dungeons 2, for example. Uh, Wars Day Thursdays where we play Warframe, World of Warcraft, you know, and any really game that has, the, I guess, the word War in it for right now uh though we may change that depending uh but we love having fun with you all and we thank everyone who's been joining us today or who's joining us through itunes or podbean for our podcast podcast which is released every monday morning and of course this show being live every wednesday at 11 a.m pacific standard time at twitch.tv slash mind mind tv now if there are topics that you want to hear us talk about or talk about more in depth please let us know you can find us on Twitter, you can find us on Instagram, which is at MindMindTV, 
or you can visit our website, which is mindmindpod.com for more information on the shows, our scheduling, and as another way to reach out to us and let us know your thoughts. And if you haven't already yet, feel free to follow, whether you're on Podbean, iTunes, or, or even on Twitch. That way you'll be the first notified when a new episode goes live or if there's any changes or updates to the show. And also, talking about this TwitchCon uh, news that's been recently let out, uh, we are now launching a Mind Mine Medium page. So it'll be a blog page with tons of different articles that either go more in depth on some of the subjects we cover in show or some ones that we don't have the time, unfortunately, to hit in shows. We really run for about two hours and we just want to elaborate more on and go more in depth on. And one of the things will be a TwitchCon 2018 survival guide that we'll be relaunching, that we'll be launching here soon. That will give you all the information on what you want and all the suggestions based on our experience from last year and others experience from the years prior. So hopefully you'll be able to check that out. And we'll announce more as soon as that article is up. Uh, so again, one way to find out is by following, and that way you'll be the first to know when that article goes up on Medium. Thank you again, everyone, who has joined us today. I have loved the commentary. It is so wonderful to speak with all of you from all over the world, all over the U.S. as well, and um, get some interesting perspectives. So looking forward to it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Have an awesome Wednesday, folks. For those of you who want to hang out with us during a game stream, remember tomorrow, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, we go live uh, with more great game stream action. Otherwise, we will hopefully see you next Wednesday. Thank you, everyone, and have an awesome, awesome day.